we all have a twistedness inside. We're all Jekyll and Hyde. Meaning by that, at times we do that which is good, but at other times we do that which is evil. It comes very naturally. We don't have to work it up. It flows naturally. I think that is really shown when you work with little kids. You only have the right to choose God until you die, right? Mm -hmm. And if you don't choose God, you go to hell. Mm -hmm. So it's a choice between choosing God or and not choosing God <laughs> is to go to hell. How is that um, not like, it's it's a choice, it's an A or B choice. Uh -huh. Whereas, would you, by still going to hell, you're still exerting a free will, but by choosing God, you're giving in to a sort of spiritual like extortion or blackmail where it's like, you know, choose me or go to hell. So <laughs> how is that a free choice where a rational human being, which, which human beings are, would see that choosing God or choosing hell is, I mean, God in heaven or whatever is a more reasonable choice, the rational choice. So not giving, you're limiting people's choices is also limiting their free will to choose something other than that. And by choosing hell over God, you're exerting your human free will that God gave you. Okay. You are free to party, party, party. You are not free to escape the consequences. You will flunk, flunk, flunk. The university is not taking away your free will when it dismisses you because you have flunked too many classes. The university is saying, young man, it's time to grow up and to realize that although you're free not to study, there are consequences to that. You will flunk and you will flunk out of this university. You are free to have unprotected sex. If you have sex with someone with HIV, although you are free to do that, you're not free to escape the consequences that you will probably contract HIV. Part of maturing means that I realize that although I'm free to make one of many choices, I am never free to escape the consequences. Just because we're free doesn't mean they're not consequences to our free decisions. But it's still a, a matter of choosing one or the other. And yeah. God creates those choices, right? So he has a control over which choices you make. No, he doesn't control whether I choose to go to heaven or hell. But yes, but he, he created us hell, and though. gave us the choice of whether we want to live life together with him or life separate from him. And so, hell is simply the result of me choosing to live my life separate from God. It's a consequence of that decision. It's God saying, I grant your request. Do you want to live life separate from me? You can spend eternity separate from me. That'll be hell. So is God a, so hell is a separate place from God? Mm -hmm. Being separate from God. Where does, God, where does God live? Ultimately, I do not know where God lives. I lean towards believing it's a different dimension. But the Bible also talks about when Christ returns a second time, he's going to redo this earth, and there will be a new heaven and a new earth. And Paul argues very clearly in 1 Corinthians 15 that in heaven, after Christ returns, we will have resurrection bodies. In other words, heaven and nirvana are quite contradictory. In Nirvana, we're disembodied spirits becoming one with everything. In heaven, according to the New Testament, you will be you, I will be me, we will be able to love each other and to love God because we will retain our unique individuality. But you'll still be with God. I mean, I don't know if it's, I mean, it's not like, you know, you're a spiritual being and, and God is in this big place and you're with him. I mean, I mean people are going to walk around calling each other by the same names or, the, I mean, it's, it's just... It's, it's metaphysical, it's not physical, so therefore it's a, an extra division from the natural, right? So it's like... Well, Paul talks about the resurrection body of Christ as being an imperishable, immortal body. And when Christ rose from the dead, he had a physical body that was comprised of different properties. So Paul is clearly arguing for a corporal resurrection body. He's arguing for it, but that does not mean that it, it is. Well, Christ had a corporal resurrection body. But we're not Christ. 
That's for sure. So, I agree with that. so by becoming, so by following Christ's example in uh, in the natural life will affect the corporality from um, from nature to spirit. Or, I mean, where where is the choice? Like, where does the choice begin? And and how you live your life, in, you know, begin. Like, where's the difference? You You're have, choosing Christ. You're also choosing His life, which, to a certain degree, is only a limited spectrum on a long um, time frame. Where it's like 33 years of corporal human existence, which is not a, is not documented, and then most of it, and then b, it's a, you know, a short time frame between becoming natural and becoming a spirit. You know, there's, I mean, there's a lot of speculation there, and a lot of disinformation. <laughs> There's a lot of mystery. You're right. I don't know exactly what it's going to be like to have a new resurrection body. I've never had one before, and so I don't know what it's going to be like. But I do know that the Jesus who rose from the dead promised that he's going to prepare a place for us, and he'll come back and receive us to be with him so that where he is, we may be also. And I do know that the New Testament leans over, over backwards to communicate the beauty, the magnificence of eternal life in heaven. Written from incredible. a human perspective. Pardon? Written from a human perspective. I'm real glad. Right. So there's no there's no experience of that afterlife. I mean, how do you know right. that these people weren't inspired by the devil, or that the devil uh, wrote the books and you know left it there for people to find, and you know, and therefore you're following Christ, you're choosing Christ, but really you should be choosing something else. Well, I think Jesus answered that magnificently when he pointed out a house divided against itself cannot stand; it will fall. And Christ obviously was attacking Satan, and Christ was insisting that God is good and that Satan is evil. And well, that he, as God in human form, went about doing good. Never once did he do evil. Well, what about all these people that are going to hell? They're divided from God. I mean, shouldn't it be the same house? Maybe the, the um, hell is the basement, heaven's the attic, or whatever. You're dividing a house. Human beings created as autonomous, independent individuals, have a free will. We can choose to live our life together with God, or we can choose to live our life separate from God. But we cannot escape the consequences of our decision. Jesus in the Bible insists, the consequence of choosing to live my life separate from God is, I will spend eternity separate from Him. But if I choose to live together with Him, if I choose to put my faith in Christ and accept His death on the cross, as the vehicle to which God offers me forgiveness for my wrongdoing, then when Christ returns, he'll give me a new body, and I will enjoy eternal life in heaven. Well, how do you do, I mean, how do you do that? How do you know you do it right? Like, how do you know you do it right? I mean, you can't just, like, go to the store and buy a, you know, bottle of Jesus and right. drink it, you know? It's like, I mean, it's, it's, it's displaced from, from 2,000 years of, in, in fact, you know, overcoming a Roman Empire and being becoming a ruling class ideology as well and being the Bible is put together by a book by a council of human beings as well really what council is the Council of Trent I mean it they, council they did, of Trent? not Trent what I forget what it's called but it's nice what is it well, I see it so you have really, yeah. So I mean, Are you so, sure of that? So yeah. So um, yeah. So certain that's wrong. Certain books of the Bible were chosen to be in this canon, yeah. and certain books were not. So yeah. like you have these stories of Jesus turning, you know, mud into a dove or something like that, where it's like it's an outside of this realm of your understanding of how to how to accept God and how to be with God. The Whereas, Council of Nicaea did nothing new. Nothing. The Council of Nicaea simply put its stamp of approval on what had already been decided. By who? The omitted sons of God, right? The majority of them. What is the, the majority of them? Like the, all the Gnostic Gospels were rejected. I pulled that out. So. But the Council of Nicaea did nothing new. The 27 New Testament books were put together by the universal group followers of Christ. How universal are they? Though? Around the known world. Like from, you know, 
Indians and, you know, North America? Like, where, I mean, like, the known world, that from Mayans? Like, this is like a very small group of people deciding where, how and when you're supposed to perceive God and making it, and I mean, like, how would you even come to know God if it wasn't through the Bible? Like, how would you even begin to understand this spiritual being in a, a human natural form if it wasn't through these stories passed down and displaced from, even from the time of birth, where they were not written down till, you know, several hundred years or a, a large amount of time between when it actually happened and when it didn't, or when it was finally recorded. The Bible was not written hundreds of years after the fact. The New Testament Gospels were all written in the first century. The reason we know that is, is because the early church fathers quoted the Gospels in letters that they wrote in 96 and 110 AD. All the Gospels were written in the first century. It was not the Council of Nicaea that determined what Gospels would be included or excluded. It was the followers of Christ, depending on the eyewitnesses, who made that decision. You learn that by reading the writings of Papias who lived from 70 to 140 A.D. Papias talks about Mark getting the information about Jesus from Peter, the Apostle Peter. Then you've got Justin Martyr, who lived from 100 to 163 A.D. Justin Martyr, writing about how the memoirs of the Apostles were read every Sunday. And you begin to realize that in the first century, the people put a major emphasis on the oral tradition. The apostles who had heard Jesus and their spoken word was given supreme value. Then the apostles began to die and more and more emphasis was put on the gospels who were either written directly by an apostle or by a scribe of the apostle like Mark or like Luke. Okay, well, what about the, the classic example of the, the message game, where I tell this person one thing, this person tells another person something, and then it goes along until finally, you know, it's a totally different message. Great point. That occurs often. Fortunately, that's not how we have the Gospels. But we have the Gospels written by Matthew, who was an apostle of Christ, by John, who was an eyewitness apostle of Christ, by Peter, who told it to Mark. And they read what those guys wrote, and they approved it and said, "This is valid." Well, but also you have a diff you have several different changes of social setting where you, you come from a Roman occupied um, Roman occupied um, colony here in Jerusalem to I don't know, say Africa, the, the darkest southern tip of Africa, where it's like it's a it's a a temporal and a um, spatial change from one place to another. So you have, but you also have interpreters who come through like Augustine and Calvin and all those other people who see the way their lives are and then reflect it in their interpretation of the Bible. And then that gets passed down because it's not like, it's a, it's a, it's a very open-ended book, right? There's a lot of interpretation. So an interpretation of this, 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 and this, and like, you know, at one point, it was like nobody could go to heaven. It was only these specific people. And then finally, it was, and then it went on to be like, you know, only people who spoke Latin could preach to whoever, could understand the book. Yeah. Then it was translated into English. And then, you know, it, it, there's an evolution where it's the different meanings are, can be assumed by the change in the time period that they're studying. Okay, so what's your real point? I'm saying it's just a big mess. There's no, there's no, um, how can you know God through this certain book when every single moment that someone else reads it, the interpretation of it changes. I have a ton of African brothers and sisters of Christ who have never taken a university class in New Testament, but who just simply read the gospels. They went to church though. It's a, it's a social, it's a social organization. You, 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 you're in, you don't think they've read the Gospels? Well, they've read the Gospels, but they are influenced by their your by you, their brother, who told them to. I mean, who's influencing you? I think I don't know. There's a lot of natural 
you know, circumstances, plus these people around me. Good. You're influencing me because okay. I wouldn't be here because right. if you weren't here. Good. I'm just glad to hear you point out that it's not just the Africans who are influenced. We're not talking about, I'm talk, that's what I'm saying, it's a social structure. What do you mean it's a social structure? The people around you say that your interpretation of the Bible, if you say, okay, say um, during the civil rights movement, yeah. the, the black the black churches were allowed to practice, or you know, from slavery, the black church uh, developed independently of the white church, right? And the white church, their interpretation of the Bible was that black people should stay in their place, they shouldn't have, you know, they should, they should. Some white churches I, okay, included that. Okay, all right. Some Other white, white churches. churches led in the uh, abolition right, right. of slavery. But it's still a social group, a social group of people determining what the, what the thing is, or what, what, the, what, the, what the Bible means. And, but whereas the blacks in the civil rights movement saw it as, you know, they took like stories of Moses and things like that and believed that they should be free as well. And then finally, you know, moved to action. But you have two separate uh, social circles giving two different interpretations in the same time period. Yeah. In like, in like, less than 100 years yeah so how is how would you do that from 2000 years ago like how many times is that going to happen in 2000 years well, that's real simple friends everybody's got a free will and everybody can interpret any book any way they want and some of us can be very dishonest and some of us can take the bible and say jesus would have supported slavery jesus founded the republican party jesus was against biology jesus was into gay bashing we can say anything we want to. And they do say it. They yeah, they do. It doesn't mean they're, the... fair, they're dealing honestly with the text. Well, if you, you read the text, honesty, there is though. no way that you can come away saying Jesus approved of racism. In his first sermon, he makes a direct frontal attack on racism and almost loses his life for it. In his best known parable, the parable of the Good Samaritan, he makes a direct frontal attack on racism. <coughs> so if I'm going to come to the scriptures and say, Okay, now how am I going to make this fit my prejudices? I can do it. I'm sure I can do it. I turn downright brilliant when it comes to doing what I want badly enough. But if I'm going to be honest with the text, there's no way that I can walk away saying, oh yeah, Jesus owns slaves, therefore I'm going to own slaves. That's dishonest. That's an abstraction. You're abstracting from what one person would, would um, interpret as honest versus another person would interpret as honest. I'm making an analytical call. I'm saying, read the Gospels for yourself, and I'm convinced, with your sharp mind, you'll be able to see that Jesus never laid the foundation for slavery. And if you do think he laid the foundation for slavery, please show me. Because it will be very easy to dynamite that one right out of the water. That one's easy. And if you want to tell me that Jesus was a Republican and started the Republican Party, it'll be real easy for me to dynamite that one out of the water. And if you tell me that Jesus had blonde hair and blue eyes, it'll be real easy for me to dynamite that one out of the water. And you know that Mark Twain was right when he said, it's not the parts of the Bible that I don't understand that disturb me. It's the parts of the Bible I do understand that disturb me. Jesus is all too clear, and the Bible is all too clear on the basics. And that's why my African brothers and sisters have a genuine faith in Christ, because they are able to read the Gospels the same way any one of us is here, but they've not bought into some of this postmodern garbage that some of us around here have swallowed, that I can't know something that someone wrote 2,000 years ago because I'm in a different culture. Give me a break. I can understand someone from a different culture. So can you. I have tre tremendous friends with people who grew up in totally different cultures than I did. <laughs> and your whole basic presupposition that because we come from two different cultures we can't communicate I mean give me a break I'm not talking about all of us come from different cultures I'm not talking that doesn't about... mean we can't communicate what would you say a good definition of love is a Christian definition of love you bet for me as a follower of Christ to love means to give to serve to sacrifice in 1 Corinthians 13 Paul writes Love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it is not rude, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. All right. Because when you talk about Jesus and you talk about love, you say that 
you will go to hell if you do not accept Jesus into your lives. And if Jesus loves us, it seems like he's setting up a condition that many people will fail simply because we're fallible human beings. So how can, he, can they, God, Jesus, expect such high standards of human beings like when there's so many other, as you would call, evil sources of information clouding our minds, like it's not our fault if we do decide something that's incorrect. So I don't see how an all-loving God that is just and fair could, and merciful, could send someone to hell because they chose something based on maybe inaccurate information, you know, at that time, not the truth. So I don't see how anyone could go to hell. Okay. I'm with you in the sense that I don't believe that anybody's going to hell because they made a mistake. Because they made a poor choice. I think Jesus makes it real clear. I think the Bible makes it real clear. But the only reason people go to hell is, is because they choose of their own volition to do that which is wrong, evil, to sin. And secondly, because they choose of their own volition to reject Christ, offer forgiveness for that sin. But the thing is, maybe they've chosen to reject Christ because they have been given information that is misleading or it does, it seems like there's a disconnect between a, a loving God that he would set up these conditions for us to fail. It makes no sense. Okay, well, no one's going to hell because they, oops, made a mistake. No one's going to hell because, oops, they couldn't put it all together well enough because they didn't have a high enough IQ. The only reason people go to hell is it's because they flip God off. All right. Um, I have a, another question about natural sin. What's your take on that? Because I have trouble understanding how humans are born. Like I've read why we're born, you know, with innate sin. But can you explain that more thoroughly? Sure. Having had three children of my own, having worked with a lot of little children in different contexts, I am convinced that Jesus and the Bible are very, very accurate when they describe the human being as follows. First point, we all are created in the image, the likeness of God, which means every single one of us has the innate ability to do that which is good. When my father was a Boy Scout in Switzerland, Adolf Hitler was vacationing in Switzerland. Adolf Hitler was very kind to my father. He shook his hand, was very polite, very respectful. I am convinced at times in his life, Hitler did some good things. Second part, I am convinced that all of us have a readiness to sin factor. We all have a twistedness inside. We're all Jekyll and Hyde. Meaning by that, at times we do that which is good, but at other times, we do that which is evil. It comes very naturally. We don't have to work it up. It flows naturally. I think that is really shown when you work with little kids. So, I think the Bible is very accurate based on my observation of children and adults. We're Jekyll and Hyde. All of us can be sweetness and kindness personified at some points, and all of us can be self-centered little twits at others. All right. Um... Second, or third question, final question. Um, okay, so in your view of God and the Christian view of God and Jesus Christ, well, more God because Jesus Christ is essential. Um, the view that he is omnipotent, like he knows all, he's all powerful. So if he knew that he'd be creating sinners and people would suffer like this, why? It seems like he got himself into a trap here. He walked in. Okay. into a corner that he can't get out of now. So why would he have set up this whole system if he knew people are going to hell? Because I'm sure he wouldn't want people to go to hell. Exactly. He does. The so Bible if he makes knew it... this was coming, why, why is it like that? You bet. The Bible real, makes it real clear in 2 Peter 3, 9, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God does not want anybody to go to hell. But, here's the dilemma. You're right, God's all-powerful. But I think it's rather clear that when he chose to create you and me, he chose to partially limit his power. He chose to partially limit his power by creating you and me with a free will. Which means 
He gave me this hand for a purpose, to love and respect him. But because I have a free will, I can use this legitimate gift in a highly illegitimate matter. Smack. I can roll it into a fist, send it crashing into his handsome face. Did God create that evil? No, I did. But, Cliff, why would God create us with a free will, knowing full well that some of us would turn it into a fist, send it crashing into his face? Because if you don't have free will, you lose the greatest gift, love. Machines don't love. It takes a human being with a free will to love. God created us to love God and to love each other. That's the purpose for which we're created according to Christ. You take free will away, you take away the ability to love. I was wondering whether you believe uh, miracles, that is, uh, events that go against the idea of physical consistency, that is, they go against physical laws. Do you believe those that are in the Bible are accurate or aren't in any way sort of exaggerations? Do you take them literally, that is? You bet. Alan Shepard, just before he was blasted off in his spaceship for the moon, was asked, What's your confidence in about getting home back safely? And Alan Shepard said, My confidence is in the uniformity of the laws of nature. That when I get out there, the same laws are going to hold to get me back. So we all celebrate natural laws. We all celebrate gravity and the predictability of natural laws. I am convinced, due to the amazing order of natural laws, that there's got to be an intelligent mind, a designer, some type of creator. If there is a creator, a supernatural God, then it is not irrational for this supernatural God to change the laws of nature that he created and perform what you and I would call a miracle. Obviously, if there's no supernatural God, it's impossible, it's irrational, it's illogical to believe that a miracle could happen. But if you allow for the possibility of a supernatural God, then it's possible that this God could change the laws of nature, perform a miracle. Well, that is exactly what the Bible claims. Well, then my question is, where are these modern-day miracles? That is, why isn't there anyone that can, for example, walk on water or fly or anything like that? Uh-huh. Well, that's my question. That Good why? question. Well, I would insist that miracles do take place today. Peter Jennings and Dan Rather do not put them on the evening news. But I would insist that miracles do take place. But wait a second, what's a miracle? A miracle is not something that happens every day. It's a miracle because it is most unusual. It's a changing of a natural law. And therefore, it does not happen every day. It's, they're miracles, which means they are the exception. That's exactly my question, though. If these miracles do happen, then what is an example of one? What is an example of a miracle that has happened in the last 100 years? Because if they do happen, and if there is some sort of... And I'm not questioning the validity of miracles. I'm just questioning what examples do you have of them. You bet. Well, yesterday, right out here, standing right where you are, a gentleman from Africa stood up and said, I disagree with all of you Americans. I'm from Africa, and you Americans limit reality far too much. I, with my own eyes, have seen people with cancer be healed. I have seen with my own eyes paralyzed people get up and walk. Now, I don't, to tell you the truth, I don't, I don't know what he believes about Jesus or whoever. But he, standing right there, said, you know, I'm into, I think he's into molecular biology or something, so he's very committed to science and to the rational process, but he's standing there saying, in Africa, I have seen these miracles take place. But in that case, what separates coincidence from miracles? That is, how is it not a coincidence that people got uh, better or that somebody that's paralyzed maybe was able to walk? Well, when you're standing there and cancer is removed from a person just by sitting there and standing there and having someone pray over them, It's a miracle. But that is to say then there's nothing in the body that could in any way be fighting back the cancer, that that person is doomed to die of cancer except for the fact that somebody's praying for them. No, it doesn't mean they're doomed to die of cancer, but I can promise you if I get cancer, I'm going to Sloan Kettering in New York City. 
and I'm going to let those surgeons cut the thing out. Yes. That's what happens usually. If you have cancer, just by standing here and having someone pray over me, I doubt the cancer is going to leave. But you're saying what this happen. man was saying, very genuinely, very sincerely is, I have stood there and watched paralyzed limbs be restored. I have seen cancer be removed from someone's body. I can't explain it. All I know is I saw it. But I don't know what the guy believes to tell you the truth. In fact, I think he's got a lot of disagreements with me. But that's what he said. But then this man's belief in the, can the fact that the cancer was removed is based on his idea that there was nothing else but the prayer or but religious or but faith, uh, but religious ideas of faith. That but, because it happened right there and then. And the paralyzed but guy who couldn't walk stood up. The blind person who couldn't see could see. But and my, he was there watching it happen. But my argument is, is that the man, because he does not know enough of the scientific principles behind either of those disorders, could not explain it. So would it be possible that he's just assigning this, you know, this to a miracle when it may not be a miracle? That's, that is my problem All right. with the idea of miracles, I guess. Is that okay. Well, I have an awful hard time looking an African gentleman in the face and saying, I'm sorry, sir, you didn't see it. Maybe you can do that. I feel very awkward doing that. Well, I'm not telling you that he didn't see a person getting better or that he didn't see a paralyzed person uh, being able to walk, but rather what is the source of that getting better? And that is what I'm asking. That, uh, how does the Bible sort of explain? Well, obviously what the Bible says is there is a supernatural God, and because there is a supernatural God, when and if God chooses, God can perform a miracle. I can't manipulate God to perform miracles when I want him to. Of course not. But if God really exists, then to believe that miracles take place is, is not irrational. It's very reasonable that a supernatural God would change a natural law and perform what we call a miracle. Okay, what about the Dead, dead Sea Scrolls, which mm -hmm. have, uh, you know, Constantine basically got in the 4th century or whenever he was, he, he got uh, all the uh, Gospels that were there put together the ones that didn't contradict each other, left the others out. There's historical evidence for that <laughs> through the Dead Sea Scrolls. How do you kind of put that together? There are Gospels which were not put in the Bible, but right. the Bible was put together by a group of men, picking and choosing which ones don't contradict each other. Okay, fair question, good question. Sir, my understanding from my study is that the Dead Sea Scrolls do not contain the Gnostic Gospels that contradict Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Rather, it's the Nag Hammadi Library in Upper Egypt, uh, right? So it's that Nag Hammadi Library in Upper Egypt that was discovered around 1945, 1946, that has the Gnostic Gospels, Gospel of Thomas, Gospel of the Nazarene, the Acts of Peter. Why were those Gospels rejected, and who rejected them, and for what reason? Those Gospels obviously are Gnostic, which means what? It means that they taught that salvation comes through knowledge, Gnosis. Those Gospels taught that the way to be enlightened was to get in touch with the God within you, to achieve enlightenment. And that it was this special knowledge that was what Jesus was really all about. Gnostics went on and rejected the Old Testament. Rejected, flat out. Gnosticism also rejects the body. It says the body's evil. The spirit is good. Well, obviously, the eyewitnesses of Christ, who knew Jesus, said, no, that's wrong. Jesus accepted the Old Testament as the word of God. Jesus did not say that the body is evil. He insisted the body's good. It's a gift from God. Be careful what you do with your body. That is why the Gnostic Gospels were rejected. You don't think they had polit political implications when Constantine was trying to unite the Roman Empire and he saw that most of the people were Christian and the way to rein them in would be to have a more concise version rather than you know be, having different sects which were out there like you said the Gnostic uh, the one that was accepted and there were uh, from some historians about at least a hundred different types of Christianity practiced till Constantine 
kind of brought them together. Now, isn't there a political reason for the way the Bible is today? I think you would have a possible point if in the 4th century, during the time of Constantine, the Gospels would have been decided upon. But when you read Papias, who lived from 70 to 140, when you read Justin Martyr, 100 to 163 AD, when you read Haitian, a Syriac Christian, lived from 110 to 183, when you read Irenaeus, 130 to 202 AD, what you begin to realize is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were accepted long before Constantine as authoritative, as reliable. They're the only text that survived. What about the other text which Constantine had destroyed? There's that happened later. Yeah, that happened later, but we don't know that those texts wouldn't have contradicted uh, the Gospels of today. Which well, they do contradict. You're right. The Gnostic Gospels contradict. Not, not only the Gnostic ones, but I'm talking about, like, you give the example of all these people who say that... Uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were the four accepted Gospels by the Church. What about the other other texts where I'm sure there were other people who wrote that they weren't the accepted texts? Only the ones which kind of were similar to the views of the day survived because rewriting uh, the, the way the uh, history was written was it was written in one piece of parchment you can rewriting it was a pain so to have rewritten all these and not rewritten the ones that contradicted these would have great political implications therefore isn't there a possibility that all this was you know getting together was a political ploy and nothing more if the New Testament Gospels had been put together in the 4th century when Constantine was in power, I would think you'd have a possible point. But in reality, it's real clear that the four Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were accepted as reliable and authoritative long before Constantine was even born. I agree to that. But there were other texts that were accepted too, right? Which were later denied. No. The Gnostic Gospels were not accepted in the 1st, 2nd, or 3rd century. They were not accepted. And what do the hist historians keep on talking about? Uh, the different sects of uh, Christianity which were warring amongst each other. Because but there were Gnostic Christians who tried to foist their views on the church, but the eyewitnesses and those who knew the eyewitnesses long before Christianity was given any political power. While the Christians were still being martyred, during the time of Diocletian and the other Roman emperors, when the Christians were living in the catacombs, the eyewitnesses and those who knew the eyewitnesses rejected the Gnostic philosophy that was creeping into the church and said, that is wrong. We are Jews who have realized that Yeshua is Messiah. We accept the Torah as the word of God. And this whole Gnostic idea that the Old Testament is not reliable, this whole idea that the body is evil and the spirit is good is baloney. Both the body and the spirit are good because God created both. They were very consistent and they held to that. Hey guys, thanks so much for watching this episode. Hit that subscribe button. We love for you to join the family. Also, want to invite you to our church in New Canaan, Connecticut. It's New Canaan High School and it meets Sundays at 9.30 a.m.